If you can just kind of dive in the scriptures, turn with me to 1 Peter, the 5th chapter, 1 Peter, the 5th chapter, the 8th verse. Uh, before I just kind of read from this, uh, as I was preparing for this message and uh, want to talk to you about uh, some of the challenges and how the enemy comes and attacks us. Uh, but I was reminded of this movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger called Predator. I don't know, have y'all seen Predator before? If not, just nod your head and act like, not, no, no. That movie ain't sanctified. Well, I, I watched the movie, and I, one, I like Arnold Schwarzenegger just because he talks weird, and uh, he has that accent, and head to the choppers, right, or I'll be back, right? No, that's Predator. I mean, no, that's Terminator. Anyway, but, but uh, it's, it's about this team of Navy SEALs, and, and there's an alien that picks them off one by one and gets them alone. And even though they're tough men and, and Navy, well, they were actors, well, except for Jesse Ventura, he was an actual Navy. Anyway, never mind all that. With, with all of that, this alien is going after them. And he has a, an invisible suit on. It's like an invisible ink. No, wait, that's Roger Rabbit. Um, <laughs> never, never mind. I've told these jokes three times and nobody's still laughing. <laughs> But, but, but with this, what reminded me is that we have an invisible enemy. And he's after us. He is, he's trying to get you alone. He's trying to isolate you. He's trying to prey upon you. And my question is, are you ready? Are you ready for the enemy that's coming after you? And I love what Peter writes in First Peter, the, the fifth chapter, the eighth verse. He says this, be sober be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. Look at your neighbor and just roar. Rawr, right? Rawr. Look at your other neighbor. Rawr. Got devils all up in your face today, right? No, I'm just, that's been funny three times in a row. Seeking whom he may devour. And so we see here that Satan Satan is a lion that's coming, and he's trying to devour you. He's trying to see you as a T-bone. He's trying to see you as a little lamb out all by yourself, away from the shepherd. He is, he's looking. He's searching. He's seeking after, can I get this one or can I get that one? And he's using his method, his, his tricks, his tactics to try to get you isolated and instead of insulated. And if he can do this, then he will devour you. But, but I love this because as I was reading that about Satan seeking after those he may devour, I, I, I love that the Lord brought this verse, John, the fourth chapter, when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well in the 23rd verse. He says this, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. The title of my message today is, Who is Seeking You? Who is Seeking You? Who is after your heart? Have you created a target for the enemy to come after you? Or are you in a place where God is pursuing you? I talked about predator, but one of the things I love is playing hide and seek with my children. Whole different game, right? The, the kids aren't really running in fear. They're actually running in amazement and excitement. Little Olivia's like, Daddy, don't catch me. Well, kind of catch me, but don't catch me, right? She wants to get caught. She wants to play the game, and we are. But my, my question is, who's seeking after your heart? Have you opened doors? Have you been disobedient? Have you allowed a place for the enemy to come in? Or, or are you a true worshiper? Have you come in spirit and in truth? And are you seeking the Father that he may seek you? See, here's, here's the beautiful thing. James writes this, those that draw near, to, uh, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Yes, I believe there's a place that, because Jesus will say, I, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Yes, there's a place in salvation where God comes and chooses us. It's by his grace that we are saved. But there's also a place that when you are saved and you are a child, that God now wants you to seek after him. And in that seeking, he has his eyes. It says in the scriptures, his eyes are going to and fro, looking for those that are true worshipers, those that he can seek after and so I wanted to give you, back in First Peter, I want to give you three H's. I call this the Triple H Sermon. 
No WWE fans today. <laughs> Triple H sermon on how the Father is seeking after you. If you go back to the first Peter, the fifth chapter, and the fifth verse says this, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. And all the people over 50 said, Amen. come on. Hallelujah. What's funny is I'm 40 now, so that number jumped to 50. <laughs> when I was in my 30s, it was 40. And of course, a decade from now, I'll be like, all the people 60 say amen, right? I just keep getting younger every year, right? It's, it's, it's like my sister, it's her birthday today. She says, somebody said I was 19. I said, bless your heart, baby. You believe that, right? So <laughs> don't worry. She doesn't listen to my messages. So yes, all of you be submissive one uh, to one another and be clothed with humility for, and he's going to quote uh, Proverbs here, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Verse 6, therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. The first H that I need you to hear from me today is that you have to be under the hand of God. Now, uh, when they were hearing this, it was invoking the language of the Old Testament. He wasn't just specifically speaking of God's hand like a natural hand. He was talking about God's hand in a way that it would lead you and guide you like the people of uh, coming out of the, um, uh, the wilderness, uh, I mean, coming out of Egypt into the wilderness and leading into the promised land. See, God's hand is a place of protection and provision. Um, if I can, if I can say it like this, m many of us, we, we, we're praying and we're saying, God, can you bless my plan? Instead of asking God, what is your plan so that I may be blessed? I've been watching some red box movies lately. Uh, one, cause I'm cheap and, and two, because there's some good red box movies to watch. And one of those movies was about Harriet Tubman. And Harriet Tubman was a, a woman who was in slavery and she came out of slavery before the Civil War escaped from slavery. And then because she was able to escape, she just didn't take her freedom for granted. She went back in and helped others escape. And what I love about the movie is it also showed that Harriet Tubman was a woman with a devout spirituality. She was a woman that truly, they didn't gloss, a lot of times Hollywood would gloss over how these people that, that were amazed, they, they were people of faith. And what, what I love about it is the movie portrayed how God was speaking to her and showing her the right way to go. In fact, there, there's a part in the movie where she's getting a moment in prayer. They're like, get up. We're about to get cut. Like, you got you to get moving. And they're like, don't touch her right now. Because when she gets a word from God, we are under his protection. We are under his hand. And see, that's the thing about God. He's not just speaking to people long ago. He's speaking to his children now. He'll tell you, hey, do this deal. Don't, don't do this deal. Take this job. Hey, marry this person. See, God will speak to you his plan for you but you have to come up under the hand but we're living a life where we're like oh god i'm gonna do what i want to do and just bless it just bless it we're finding it's a struggle why am i why am i getting devoured why why, why am i having a tough time at, at work why is it why, why, why aren't things going my way it's because you haven't come up under the hand you've decided to do what you want to do and that's the place where it, don't we see this with Daniel in the lion's den yes. see Daniel just didn't just get thrown in the lion. it just didn't face persecution he was a person of prayer he was seeking God in prayer and see a person that comes up under and seeks God in prayer God will shut the mouths of the lions people may be after you you may be a struggle Satan may want he, I'm coming after you but God will shut his mouth you learn how to hear his word. But you've got to come up under the hand. And it's not just protection. There's provision in the plan of God. Can I preach a little bit today? Y'all going to have to help me out a little bit today. See, there, there's provision. I love, um, Peter knows about this provision. He, he's going to go, go with Jesus to the temple and they say, whoa, y'all need to pay taxes. And of course they didn't have TurboTax or H&R Block, right? And Jesus says, you know, we're, we're not supposed, we're sons, we're not supposed to pay taxes, but so we don't offend them 
go ahead and Peter, I want you to go fishing. The first fish that you pull out of the sea, when you pull, uh, you're, you're going to see money in his mouth, pull out that money, pay the taxes. See, that's the thing. Jesus will provide provision if you follow instruction. And I got I to gotta help some of us out because we think the devil's after us in our, in our finances, but you just Amazon clicking away. Let, let me say it like this. You can't spend more than you make and expect God to bless it. Nobody want to hear this all the time. I mean, some of y'all spending so much and you need to eat ramen noodle. And that went over like a lead balloon on all the, like, everybody like, no, nah, I got to get a steak, right? No, you need to eat some ramen noodle, get your bills under control. Stop blaming the devil because you overspend. But yet, if you find yourself in a position where you've been faithful and you've been a good steward and, and, and you've been uh, 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 trustworthy with what God's given you, when the devil comes and tries to attack you, God will pro provide provision. You just simply have to follow instruction. Some of you need to go fishing. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let, me, let me stop being so parabolic. You, you need to get a job. <laughs> get a job. God will provide in that place. Yeah. And see, it's in that place that coming up under the hand of God, that God's provision, God's protection, his plan is made a way in your life. And the devil, he may, he may be trying to devour you, but God says, I am the lion of Judah. Watch me roar. But I find a, a, a lot of us, and it, it, this is my second point, is this, a humble heart is heard. A humble heart is heard. Now, when I speak of humility, I do not mean speaking less of yourself. In fact, a lot of people think humility is saying, oh, I'm stupid. Oh, I'm just no good. I can't believe it. Actually, that's not humility at all. That's still a very prideful person. A humble person is not someone that thinks less of themselves. It's someone that thinks of themselves less. You learn how to get yourself off your mind. And what I, what I find is many of us, we struggle with the, the attacks of the enemy because we're so full of ourselves. And, and, and so now the enemy is able to just throw his plan against us. And, and I love this because while humility is the antidote, Peter's going to give us some insight on how the enemy operates. Um, you know, General Sun Tzu, when he wrote The Art of Warfare, he said, know your enemy. And in here, Peter gives us, in 1 Peter, the 5th chapter, the 7th verse, he says this, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. See, what Satan will do is if you don't remain humble, if you don't get yourself off your mind, he's going to then throw anxiety, worry, fear. He's going to tell you that coronavirus is going to get you, even though you're drinking Bud Light. I probably shouldn't have said that joke, but you need to be drinking nothing but water, but that's a whole nother story. So I mean, I praise God, brother. You wouldn't have so much worry. He does say be sober, right? So, so he's going to throw anxiety in, and how does anxiety work? What, what's, what makes anxiety a target that you think about yourself? That you're trying to figure it out. If I can do it on my own, if I can, I can make this happen. And so you're on your mind and you're trying to say, how can I make myself get the provision? And so as you're thinking, oh, I'm me, me, this, this. What it does is it gets you out of the operation of how you were created. You were never created for yourself. And when, you, when you're on your mind, you're, you're malfunctioning. It's just like a microwave. If I put metal in a microwave, what would happen? Unless you want to see the light show. We're going to have a problem. And see, you were never, from the beginning, you were never created to be about yourself. But when you do, cares become a problem, anxiety is a problem. You were created to have faith and trust God. And see, here's the thing. Trusting God is believing the promises, believing the best, believing that God is for you. But what Satan does is he says, I'm going to twist that ability that they have to believe, and I'm going to get it to go in the opposite direction, that they believe the worst is going to happen. They believe that it's never going to work. I'm always going to fail. And if I can get them to believe in the wrong direction, then what they'll have is those things they believe will come to pass. Doesn't Job say that? What I greatly feared has come upon me. 
And that's because you were created with this ability to believe. And so either you're going to believe in the promises of God or you're going to believe the worst. Is, oh, I'm going to die. The virus is going to get me. I'm ne- it's a recession. I'm never going to get a job. And then you find yourself with self-fulfilling prof- prophecies. Why is that? Because you were created as a, a, a spirit being with the ability to believe. Now, either I'm talking crazy or the Bible's true. We'll find out one day. And so, what I love about this is he says that Satan's going to try to put doubt, anxiety, fear, worry. But he also, there's a second part to this. He says, cast your cares upon the Lord for... And see, the second thing that Satan will go after is he tries to use your experiences to say, see, God doesn't love you. So you went through that issue. God must not love you. If he's all powerful, if he's all loving, if he's all knowing, then why did you go through that? That's the accusation atheists make against God. Well, if you claim these things about God, then why are these, these problems and this suffering? And it's like, have you read the Bible? Like, have you actually read the scriptures and read what God said about himself? Because he talks about an enemy, a clear enemy, who has authority, false authority on this earth. And he's bringing problems and pain and suffering and death. And what he's doing is he's saying, let me get them to believe that God doesn't care about them. And see, what happens is a lot of believers, instead of basing uh, the love of God upon the cross, you base it upon experiences. And so you're up one day because you got the promotion and you missed some red lights. But then you're down this day because kids are sick and I got a divorce. But what if we could live in this center place of truth? See, Jesus never says that experience will set you free. He says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Free from all the things that go up and down. Free from all of that. How does, how does that happen? It's because you say, I, this is what I say. How can God not love me because he sent a son? So while somebody says God can't love me because this goes on in the world or this went on and my mom died from cancer, I say, how can God not love me? Because when I was an enemy, he sent a son. And I wake up with that truth every day. Well, why do you wake up with that truth every day? Because that's what sets me free. That's what, when things go wrong around me and crazy around me, that's what centers me in life. That's what allows me to, when I have situations and issues and anxieties and worries, it allows me to cast it upon the Lord because he has to love me. He sent his son. And belief is able to function and operate in that place. I'm preaching way too good. I'm going to listen to this later and amen it myself. That's, that's truth. And see, I, I love the, the third thing where humility is the antidote to these struggles. The third thing he mentions there is in the ninth verse. He says, resist him. He doesn't say run. He says, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. You know what uh, Satan will do is if, if he can get anxiety, he can get you to run from God, he gets you you isolated and I know I've faced this deception I know I've counseled countless others who face this deception and it's simply this that I'm the only one with this issue I'm the only one with this problem and so instead of getting together and linking arms together you isolate yourself you get alone you you, you say oh no it's I, what about me it's all about me and we become so filled with ourselves not understanding Peter's writing here and saying we're all going through the same issues yes. Yes. so you get alone and you feel like oh well, maybe instead of getting with your brother or your sister and saying can we pray together can we work through this together? See, because I, I find that when we're humble and we walk with this humility of ourselves not on our mind, God operates and he promotes and he exalts in that place. Uh, I watched another movie. Um, it's not called Mr. Rogers, and I probably, it, but it's about Mr. Rogers. And it, what I loved about that movie, and I didn't, it didn't say this, I've, I've known about Mr. Rogers' life and uh, watched a documentary about him, but he was a ordained minister in the Methodist church. 
And he felt like his ministry would be greater if he went into TV instead of doing vocational ministry. And so as he went into TV, he became a pretty famous dude. I don't know if you know about Mr. Rogers and the beautiful neighborhood. And, and, but, but a real famous dude. But yet, yeah, here's the thing about Mr. Rogers. He didn't use his fame to think about himself. In fact, he didn't think about himself. And he worked on it. He constantly worked on it to promote others and help others. And the movie portrays this. It goes well out of the way to, to show how Mr. Rogers was going after the one, reaching people and loving people, even though he didn't need to. He was all right. And see, here's what I find. I, I think a lot of us, we don't do that. We don't love other people. We'll say stuff like this, and this hadn't gone over. This has been a lead balloon. But hear my heart on this. We'll say things like this. Well, I'm just not good with names. I can't remember people's names. And what you're saying there is you're saying, I don't care about people. I know. that's. It got silent, air out of the room. What if we changed our language and said, you know what, God, help me with names. Help me. You remember people. You care about people. Help me to remember people. Mr. Rogers, when he'd get up and pray in the morning, he would remember the names of people he was praying. Not, they weren't related to him. It wasn't his four no more. He was all about praying for others and blessing them. And so I, I love in the movie, it portrays, I don't know if he did it in the movie, but he would wake up every morning and, and call out and recite and pray over people. Why did he do that? Because you have to Work at being humble. Doesn't come natural. Your natural tendency is to live like the fall and live like Adam and think about yourself. But he worked at it. And when you work at it, it says God will exalt you. In due to, what does it say in that sixth verse? Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in. Last point that I need you to get today. Hold on. Hold on. Y'all got, got the Triple H sermon today? That's what I do, three H's, right? Hold on. I need you to outlast the devil. Um, my uh, oldest daughter likes to watch YouTube stars, uh, which is kind of crazy, our society now, where people anywhere can be a YouTube star. And Anyway, um, w with all that said, one of the games that they play on the YouTube stars is they'll play who can who can stay the longest. And... Uh, this this one time they were giving away a car and they put five people in the car and they say, whoever stays the longest in the car gets to keep the car, right? And so they were just holding on. like. And I'm glad it was a 10-minute broadcast because I don't know if I could have been there for the whole time that they were, and I'm sure it stank and struggled and all that. But but here's here's the beautiful thing I'm asking you. Can you hold on to the reward? Here's the risk that Satan runs when he attacks you. He runs this risk of forming you into the image of Jesus. Amen. That everything you go through, every suffering, every trial, every persecution, if you answer it with a, a, a Christ-like attitude, when you come out of that season, there was a resolve, there's a steadfastness in your heart that you say, you know what, I went through that issue and God has delivered me by his mighty hand. And it's that type of attitude that can hold on, that can go back and help others when they're in their situation and bring them through their trials. You used to be a drug addict, but God delivered you and now you're going back to others and saying, you used to be homeless and on the streets and now you're going back and saying, God delivered me from that situation. See, it's a person that knows how to hold on. Can you hold on? I love Galatians. It says, "Be not weary in well doing, for in, uh, uh, be, be not weary in well doing, for in uh, due season you will reap if you faint not." I remember the only time I fainted. Um, <laughs> boy, it's like, oh Lord, he's saying the story again. But uh, I was I was in high school and I gave blood and I had to go to the restroom before I gave blood and and uh, so I gave blood and I was like, oh let me let me go up and go to the restroom and as I was going to the restroom. Like these beautiful stars just started to come down. And I was like, oh, they're pretty stars. And then next thing I know, I wake up in a puddle of urine. I hope it was mine, you know. <laughs> My only time to faint ever in life. But see, Paul's saying there in Galatians that if you could continue to do good and not quit, do good when people aren't watching. 
do good when the boss is still mad at you. Be nice to your spouse even though she gone crazy. Still love your... Why are y'all looking at Marlo like I'm... Not every sermon is self-reflecting, my friends. I'm speaking to your language, right? I got good, I got good marriage. Oh, well, then let me drop this. When your when you're, uh, kids are teenagers and they're still crazy. Now, that y'all know that doesn't apply to me. My kids aren't teenagers yet. But still, yeah, when they become teenagers, I can't even use that example. They're like, Daddy, you were talking about me, right? But I, I say all that. Can you do good? When it doesn't look like there's a reward. See, God can bless that type of heart. I remember for my own life, and many of y'all have heard this, 2015, there's a struggle. There's, a, there, there, there's issues in my heart, but yet God's saying, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to promote you. The church is going to grow. And, and I remember coming out of that place and struggling in 2016. I, I humbled myself under the hand of God. And then God began to speak that to me. It just didn't come through the prophets. It, God was speaking to me and saying that to me through his word and through dreams and visions. And then I, I come to the church and I say, we're going to grow. Jesus is amazing. And everybody's like, that dude's loony. If we ain't grown by five years, that ain't going to happen, pastor. Not like you're any different. But yet, he started to change me. And he started to show me what humility was really all about. That when I went to Walmart, I wasn't like, no one talked to me. I've already counseled for the day. I'm a pastor. I don't want to deal with anybody, right? Instead of having that heart that I used to have, I was like, God, who can I touch in this place? Walmart wasn't about my list to get milk. I still got the milk, but it wasn't about that. It's about who can I reach. And when I started doing that daily, over and over and over and over again, God would begin to like share with me and speak with me, and the church began to grow. In fact, even recently, I love it because... If you live this way of humility, God will speak to you because you're near to him. I even had God speak to me recently. I was sharing in our leaders meeting with our pastors that uh, I, was, I, I was at Taco Cabana with my, friend, with my neighbor and there was a deaf couple that was sitting next to me. And so I went over to go pray for them and, and I couldn't really speak. I don't know sign language and I was just like, I want to pray for you. And they're like, what is he doing? Like he's crazy. And, you know, I'm kind of wild with my hands and so... But, but then I just pointed to my shirt that said Jesus, and they're like, oh, Jesus, you want to pray? And what was amazing is I got to pray for them and believe with them that God can heal them. But, but God also spoke to me in that moment. He, he was showing me. I got another language on how to say Jesus. But then even after that, that night, I get to watch the Mr. Rogers movie that I told you all about. And Mr. Rogers then gives another sign language. And, and, and you may see it as serendipity, but I see the sovereignty of God speaking. And, and Mr. Rogers said, this in sign language means friend. And I said, Jesus, are you saying, are you saying to me that I'm a friend of you? How do I hear stuff like that? I humbled myself. I got myself off my mind so that God could speak to me. And if you want to get in that place, humble yourself under his mighty hand and he'll exalt you in due season. If not, you a T-bone for the enemy. We all bow our heads. You know, I never want to close a service without giving you an opportunity to know Jesus. I talked about the devil, the adversary, but until you know Jesus, Satan's actually your father. But if you want to get out of that struggle, that depression, that worry, that, that fear that that father creates, and you want to come under the place of peace, and joy, and righteousness, you have to be born again. You have to be born under the father of heaven. And there's only one way. And that's His Son, Jesus Christ. And so if that's you today, you say, you know what, I want Jesus. Or, or maybe you're just not living right today. Maybe if I were to examine your life, you say, man, I'm, I'm far from God. I know for my own life, I'm the grandson of a pastor. I gave my life to Jesus at a young age. And some disappointments caused me to stray away. But I remember in 2001, I rededicated my heart to Jesus. And I've never been the same. 
You know, if that's you today, you want to you make a first-time commitment or you want to rededicate your life, just raise your hand high in there. I want to pray with you today. Anybody here? Yeah, I see that hand. He's for you. Yeah, I see that hand. Anybody else? Come on. God is for you. He's not against you. I know things have not looked like they've gone your way, but Jesus came to die for you, to set you free. If you want to be free from that depression, free from that anxiety, you want to stop being a T-bone for the enemy, accept Jesus. Father, you see all those hands lifted up towards you. Go. Father, we just rededicate our hearts to you today. Make us right with you. It says that you see us as holy, as blameless, as above reproach. So we ask that you would forgive us of our sins, wash us clean today, that we would be holy in your sight. Jesus, we believe you died on the cross and rose again and that you're seated at the right hand of the Father. And you're coming again, Jesus. And God, you're more than a God. Now you're our Father. Teach us, guide us. Holy Spirit, fill us right now. In Jesus' name I pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. If you prayed that simple prayer with me, you're brand new in the kingdom of God. It says old things have passed away, all things are new. Just want to encourage you with two words today. Welcome home. Welcome home. You're in the family of God.